Uh, let's get started. The first presenter today is Professor Chris Ledendorfer from Vitoria University of Guadalupe in New Zealand. Um, he's an associate professor of engineering here. And he's going to talk to us a little bit about a brief history of citizen science, the democratization of high of HPC, high performance computing. So with you, Professor Chris. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Right, so I was in a two minds about what to do with this talk because I had a very open brief. And what I actually decided to do was go back in, in time a few years uh, to talk about citizen science because this was some of the most fun I had while I was researching uh, in, over the last decade or so. It's not the stuff I'm currently doing, and I'll talk a little bit about what current work is at the end. There is a linkage. It, it does sort of make sense. But um, this was a lot of fun. So I thought I'd take you through some of that journey about um, citizen science. And in fact, why, if anything, it's become more important that we should get this right. So the very first thing to say is that we're really undergoing, and have been undergoing, but it's snowballing, a disruptive change in the way basic science is carried out across all sorts of fields. You pick a field, medicine, um, anthropology, uh, whatever, it's being impacted by computing, by data, and by storage. And those are all things that we as computer scientists, at least, I assume most of you are computer scientists or engineers? Mm -hmm. Yep, okay. Um, have a direct responsibility for it. In particular, because these, you know, bi a biologist isn't particularly interested in becoming a computer scientist as an adjunct to their career. So, not only are these challenges, these are enormous opportunities because tremendous science is being done at the moment using these tools. So let's talk about you know, some elephants in the room. Let's talk about big data and big science just for a moment, and then I'll say we're not doing that. But big data, the biggest data there is is cosmology. And the square kilometre array, which is being planned now, has ridiculous numbers associated with it. Let's have a look up here. By the mid-2020s, which is phase one of the square kilometre array, they'll be looking at 5,000 petabytes, 5 exabytes uh, worth of raw data. That, that's a number so big that my brain doesn't understand how big that number is. For the full SKA, SKA they're talking about a factor of 100 on that. I, I, I stopped believing at that point. I, I personally can't process those numbers. That my, my head explodes. So the data problem is only going to get worse. And of course, the computation problem as well. I mean, if you've got lots of data, you've got to do something with it. There's no point putting it in a box. Okay? To give you some ideas and a perspective about this, this isn't the full SKA. This is the current one. Worldwide annual Google searches, which you know, everybody does Google searches all of the time. It's... It's only about 100 petabytes. Facebook, surprisingly to me, was about twice that. Uh -huh. I don't like Facebook. Yet half this talk is going to be on Facebook. So oh. I know, isn't it awful? Global business emails. I'm not sure how they classified that, but I'll just believe these numbers. 3,000 petabytes. But the raw data from the SKA mid, so that's the midpoint, will be 62 exabytes. I mean, uh, those numbers. Now, it's not just data. Global internet traffic is one zettabyte. Ultimately, the SKA will have five zettabytes internally, not put out onto the internet. So they'll need to build or have access to supercomputers with a speed of approximately 300 petabytes. Fastest supercomputer in the world, I hope this is still up to date, uh, 33.86 petabytes. Petaflops, sorry. So the SKA will need to have a, super, a computer between 6 and 10 times faster than the fastest machine currently on Earth. Crazy big, big numbers. Big science is awesome like that. It, it, it's, 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 it's like having an enormous ball roll towards you in some ancient temple. Indiana Jones, in case any of you are too young to appreciate that. <laughs> um, now let's look at another project. Um, so the S S K SKA's contributions and discoveries are a thing to the future. What about one that's currently at the moment? The LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. Mm -hmm. They confirmed oh, no. the existence of the Higgs boson. Amazing piece 
an amazing piece of science discovered to be a life form. They have a petabyte of data generated by detectors and up to 30 petabytes stored each year. Um, it's a distributed computing infrastructure, which is in a grid. Uh, they were moving to the cloud. I'm not actually sure what's happened to that. I remember going to several presentations when they told me that they presented the whole new cloud architecture. And I've not heard anything for a very long time, so yeah, who knows. Um, they have a continuous data transfer rate of 6 gigabytes per second, 600 terabytes a day across a worldwide grid. So grid is a great big distributed uh, computing device. Um, and they have it arranged in tiers, tertiary tiers and so on and so forth. More than 100 petabytes moved and accessed by around 10,000 people. And if that grid, that big distributed computer, was actually in one place, then it would be among the top supercomputers on the world. But it's not. It's a set of distributed computer systems, including supercomputers. Um, and here's a, here's a nice graph of disk and tape storage, number of petabytes, and as you can see, it's, it's doing that thing that we always get worried about. So, big data. Those are the ones that get all the press. They are the ones people are thinking about, and really pushing computer science, pushing the edges. But those aren't all the science projects we do. Not all science is big. Okay? Not all science is big. Well, oh, I've said the top bit. They don't, these big projects, these big stars, don't actually represent the majority of science that needs to be carried out in this world. There's a lot of smaller, local research that's good, it's valid, and it, and it needs resources. It, they don't have billions of dollars of research grants and stuff to install custom high-performance computing infrastructures and so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, there are mid-tier stuff as well, things like Montage, uh, Cybershape, and LIGO. Um, now, what's going on here? So, Montage is a mosaic software for astronomers. Uh, LIGO is a la oh, God, okay. laser interferometer gravitational wave observatory. So, these are still things to do with astronomy, uh, like the SKA, but they're at a vastly smaller scale. And these are things that can run on things like commercial clouds. These are things that can run on local HPC clusters and things like that. So, but they're well funded. They can have it, sometimes they get some specialised equipment put aside, uh, budget for them. And so you can think about those as the successful mid-tier. But, you know, we, in general, scientists need resources, data, analytics, storage, in all sizes, from small local projects through to large global projects. One size does not fit all science. And some, I had to put this in, some projects must run on a shoestring. Every single project I've ever done has run on the shoestring. And I, I have never, you know, had a budget like SKA or LHC. Um, so I, I personally relate very strongly to this, this line here. So what can people on a shoestring? Well, they can appeal to the general public to obtain resources that might otherwise go wasted. So if you think about your, your, your computational device, right? I mean, this thing... It's a MacBook Pro. It's ridiculously powerful considering I'm displaying a PowerPoint slide. I'm, I'm probably using, I could bring up the performance monitor, but I'd be surprised if I was using more than 5 to 7% of my CPU. It's just burning, wasted, thrown away. You don't get those seconds back that could potentially be used for other computers. So, what people wanted to do was harness that waste of computation. You can't store unused computation. We don't have time machines. So, I have to admit, I committed a sin by being a computer scientist and focusing on computation. I really shouldn't do that because that's not just what this talk is about. Um, but basically, by appealing to the general public, resources and data, can work by leveraging existing community groups, organisations, and individuals. So I'm going, now going to talk about what citizen science is in general. Um, citizen science is scientific research conducted by, uh, uh, in whole or in part, amateurs, non-professional scientists. 
In fact, once upon a time, all scientists were amateurs. And then these people came along and said, you know, we can do this professionally, we know how to do this. And they, they kind of, professional scientists like me and most of the people in this room are going to end up being, kind of, hey, did that flick through? I don't know how that happened. Kind of took it all over. Um, but citizens have been, had a long history of working both independently and alongside uh, professional scientists. This can also be, has also been called crowd science, crowdsource science, civic monitoring, volunteer monitoring, network science, participant review monitoring, slash research. Now, this picture here shows a person out in the bush with a pen and they're taking down notes about some particular condition to do with the, their environment. This person is not a computing device. This person is, and, and I'm going to do this in a little bit more detail later, this, this person's a sensor. Okay. Now, you know how I showed you that um, big LHC, massively funded uh, CERN, etc.? Well, even the big guys can use citizen um, science. So this here is helping to find the siblings of the pigs. And so it's a citizen science project called Higgs Hunters, where everyone has a chance to um, search for the Higgs boson's relatives, as they say. So volunteers searching through thousands of images of the Atlas experiment on that website, actually looking at these images and trying to, to analyse them. All right. So even the big projects can take advantage of citizen science. So what's a history? Another nice one in the scene. Now, um, as I said, it's been known by other names. I'm not really quite sure what's going on here. There's, there's something slightly odd with this presentation. Ah, oh, come on! Okay, so... Wireless, wireless communication. Oh, I, I, somebody is, is mentally influencing <laughs> So, anyway, there was a great increase in programs in the 1990s um, with the widespread use of the internet because Truth, uh, widespread citizen science, science became reliant on the communication. Um, now, the term first entered into the Oxford Dictionary only in 2014, but we've been using it for a really long time. So, what is citizen science to a computer scientist? So this is the confessional bit, right? This is where I'm going to take my own incredibly biased view about what sci citizen scientist is. And, and please excuse me going off on this sort of thread of fancy. Um, I like to think of citizen science as the building of a cloud using crowdsourced resources. These resources could be data collected from sensors who are people through to compute resources supplied by people. Mm -hmm. um, and it can, of course, be you know, computation carried out on mobile devices. Um, in such cases, my kind of very slightly matrixy view of this is that those people are a component of that cloud you're building. And that cloud you're building is a machine for performing science composed of people and communications technology. Now, on to sort of slightly less um, strange stuff. Science is described by the American um, Association for Advancement of, Sci of Science as having 13 processes. And from the viewpoint of my machine, I reckon there's four of those processes that can be implemented as part of this um, cloud crowd. Observation. Observation. So this is the fun, one of the fundamental processes. Um, this is the gathering of information mm -hmm. um, through any one of the five basic senses. So those are our people here, the senses there. Um, it's an observation as an objective process of gathering data through the use of one's senses in an analytical way. And senses there was senses like taste, hearing, smell, rather than senses as in a sensing device. Um, measurement is an observation made by a specific comparison or measurement you know, against a meter or a reference or a weight or something like that. It's exactly what you'd think it was. Classification, the grouping of objects to belong to some classification scheme. Um, uh, some, some observable trait. And then quantification, of course, is trying to apply numbers to uh, your observations. So these two are quite linked. This is linked. This one is a slightly different. But those are all things we can usefully get out of the sensors to actually do. Alright. 
This was an interesting question I found in, in another person's book I looked at. And the question was, is citizen science science? And of course it is, especially once it's peer-reviewed. Uh, and anyway, there was this lovely graph which basically showed the number of publications using um, citizen science for its data. So this is the type of graph we look at. What's the value of citizen science? It's actually more than is realized. Citizen science doesn't actually get, oh, come on, the credit it deserves. And I found this nice and interesting. Oh. Come on, ah, I don't know what's going on. I must have used a template with some odd slide transitions. It, it's my fault. I've, I've used a template with some default. Oh, okay. uh, we'll just have to live with it, I'm sorry. Uh, I hadn't actually. Yeah. No. Anyway, I, I put this asterisk here because I don't believe this statement. This was a statement in a paper about the value of citizen science. Quality of data collected by volunteers on a project by project basis has, a, has generally been found to be as reliable as the data collected by professionals. That's actually really an interesting statement. I put the star in. Because I know it's not true for a volunteer computer. And I know it's not true for um, medical studies where they do um, food diaries. It's proven to be untrue for that. So, there you go. I don't know about that statement. I put it here so we May I just say something? Yep. Um, I coordinated a project on curating an animal sound collection and uh, put computer science students and biology students curating the data and the computer science students were much better than the biology mm. students because for them it was another boring yes, uh, biology project. Whereas for the computer scientists, students, it was a different domain. Have I been to a so it just seems a little bit like that. Have you been to a presentation? Have you given a presentation on that in science? I'm sure I've heard you say that before. Maybe. It's very that, familiar that anyway. anyway. But anyway, I found that <laughs> statement and I put the asterisk in it because I don't believe it. Oh, okay. But that's not that simple. Um, I, I kind of put that up because some people are claiming that. And I found that a, a very interesting thing. Um, I suppose that you could argue that maybe professions are unreliable too. In which case, yeah. Uh, anyway, I found, um, I, 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 don't, I really hope none of you have seen these. Well, I, in fact, I hope all of you have seen these. But I found some interesting videos. There was a, there's actually been a very recent documentary series on the crowd and cloud or citizen science. And I thought we just, ah, we, can we do sound on? I can take this over there. <laughs> so this is a this is kind of a little bit of an editorial, which has nothing to do with me. But I thought I'd play because it was a it was a rather it was a rather interesting little um, oh, oh, teaser for um, this series. There, there's four episodes which you can find on YouTube. Um, the URLs up on the side here. Um, but um, this is the. I mean, it's TV. It's production for TV, right? mm -hmm. so it's and it's by Americans, so it's a little bit, you know, over the top. But anyway, I hope no one's offended now. No. Through the centuries. And across the continents, one woman can make a difference. Across the ages and in every nation, one man can achieve great things. There are now, hundreds, thousands, millions of individuals have the chance to work together to confront and solve the challenges of flood and famine, earthquakes and epidemics, and a changing climate. Today, the crowd can make history. For the first time, people can find like-minded others across their countries and around the world 
using cell phones and computers to span time and space. That's the cloud. I'm Walid Abdullahi, host of the Crowded Cloud. I've studied Earth's ice sheets from satellites and aircraft, and I was NASA chief scientist at the time Curiosity landed on Mars. So I know big data and big science, but I'm also convinced that citizen-generated data has an important role. In the crowd and the cloud, makers adapt off-the-shelf tools to help fill gaps left by official channels. Citizen scientists capture data about local air pollution and help change policy. In China, an environmental activist puts government data on a mobile app and invites citizens to report polluters. Every year at Christmas, thousands of bird watchers continue a hundred years of observations. In Uganda, World Bank enumerators and local partners collect the numbers that will help farmers feed the young nation. No longer is science something only done in labs. No more is data only the property of corporations and governments. And these are just some of the stories you'll experience with me in The Crowd in the Cloud. Super exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Don't watch them. <laughs> uh, I mean, they're not as exciting as that. Obviously, that was quite condensed. But there's some really interesting things um, in in this series, like the use of open street maps after tsunamis, after mm -hmm. earthquakes, to actually map out, of course, where the roads and the buildings and all of the things were in poorly documented places, like in Kathmandu and Nepal and um, and so on and so forth. And it really does a nice job of focusing on these sort of collaborative crowd type um, projects. Now, how do you value citizen science? Well, this was quite a, a, a this was quite a nice value to find. I only found it for biodiversity, but uh, volunteers apparently contribute two and a half billion dollars to biodiversity research. I do horrible thing. And um, I mean, this is obviously in the data they're generating, the observations they make rather than that actually having to be paid for to be collected. Um, I, I, I was tempted to show you a second one, because I thought this was quite a... Uh, this, is, this is a bit more specific. This is actually an example of a citizen science project involving mobile devices and people with sensors. Um, I will show it. I do think I've got time. Um, again, it's the same people, so... It's exciting, but substance, yeah. We want to collect valuable data, but we want it so that you can easily do it and have fun while you're doing it. When I first heard of the app, I thought of Pokemon. Everyone is running around with their phones, you know, collecting stuff. Yes. So we're helping and we're, 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 we're contributing to a bit of but we're also helping. And that's the good thing about it. I hope that you all become mosquito enthusiasts, at least in, in trying to find those places where they are. So here we have the community garden, but as you look around, uh, explore. Let's see if you find you, you think that there, there is some standing water in places, and if there's standing water, well, you have a habitat. You have a habitat. Yeah. So open your app up, and then uh, when you find something, you know, identify it using the drop-down menus. Take a picture. Okay. So here it is. So now, do you want to do? Is it a container? Is it a plant pot? Is it tri Is it trash? Is it trash. a tire? Okay. I'm going to make this a bit bigger. But you see all those red triangles right there? So here is the, the site that we found when we first came in. Then we did this site right here where we found the uh, plant pot. Then down here uh, we found a wheelbarrow. Might as well and so all those triangles there are all the different samples. And I have not put any samples into my phone. These are the ones that you guys have done. But it's all going, you know, into the cloud and then into the map we all share. It comes down to tracking the mosquito, which allows you to track the virus, track the disease, allows you to find out where it is and intercept it. This is not 
just something in another country that's never going to affect you. you know, this affects the whole world. This is going to affect you, your home, everything like that. The specimen should be right in front of you. Mm -hmm. So then you can move your wine anywhere you want. Here you go. Here it is. Mm -hmm. So can you move it so you can get more of the tail in there? Mm -hmm. There you go. Even a big SSR microscope would allow you to see the things you can. But yes, it allows you to really, really get in there. See, I really like a like, tiny aspect of this get a I don't see apps that get really changes to get like a lot of size. I'm, I'm actually going to stop there because they said the important things. Mm -hmm. And they said fun. Mm -hmm. And you saw those people operating within a community. Okay? They were having fun, they were out with other people. So, and they were, they were making positive impacts on their own local environment. And that's, that's actually a difficulty we have when we talk about volunteer computing because it's an abstraction away. It's hard to see the impact on a personal level. So anyway, I thought I'd do some Google Trends through this talk. Um, so that's the Google Trend for um, citizen science. And, you know, it's a bit jaggy, but it's normalized to, these are all normalized to 100. I don't actually know what the, the core values are, but it's, it's an upward trend. So these sorts of citizen science, which, which does include volunteer computing, by the way, is increasing in popularity. It's getting searched more often. People are presumably doing more of these activities out in their communities. So now we can sort of talk about, well, what type of citizen science is it? How do we do how do we sort of build a taxonomy of understanding the sorts of citizen science we're talking about? And we'll start here, level one, crowdsourcing. This is this is the simplest version, this is the simplest form of citizen science. Citizens are census, we've talked about that, and volunteer computing with our providers of resources. Um, if you're interested in the paper this yes. was in. It's um, Citizen Science and Volunteer Geographic Information, an Overview and Typology of Participation, Muku Hakley. Oh, Actually, I, know. I would love that this slide as well. Okay. Thank you. So, level two, distributed intelligence. So this, this one is pretty easy, right? This is, this is something we can organize, we can write an app for that, we can build a, an infrastructure for sharing computation for that. But here, we're adding additional intelligence. We, we're using citizens as interpreters of information. Um, or, you know, volunteered thinking as it's classified. And as we go up, we, get, we, we move away from the citizens being just a very simple replaceable unit to actually much more uh, participatory. So level three is participating in problem definition and data collection and collaborative science. Right way at the top. But this is this is the this is the place where the crowd is most useful because this is where you want big numbers mm -hmm. of people, mm -hmm. big numbers of resources. And as you go up this tree, obviously your required expertise increases dramatically. See now it won't even change page. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about that one at the right at the bottom there, that volunteer computing. Um, volunteer computing was, was kind of cool. When it came out, it was sold as a cure for cancer, a cure for a better cryptographic systems, investigating climate change, searching for intelligent life. Those are all projects associated with the early versions forms of uh, volunteer computing. And of course, those were all projects that needed computation. So I went and grabbed a history. I, I can't pretend I wrote this with great scholarly... Um, Never lives or anything. But basically, access to HPC clusters was expensive and required lengthy waits. So even if you had the money, you had to know the right people. You had to be buddies with the right scientists who would let you get access to their clusters and so on and so forth. So volunteer computing offered a way of decoupling that and giving research groups vast computing power without that sort of the, the cost or the uh, requirements of knowing who the right people were. Um, it, the first volunteer computing um, project that I know about was the 1996 The Great Internet Machine Prime Number Search. That's a long time ago, 20 years ago. 
And the volunteer computing name came quite a lot later. Uh, in 1989, they introduced City at Home and Folding at Home were launched, and they were separate. Um, and basically, both of them used screen savers uh, to perform computation. So while your while your machine went on screen saver, you you did the set search for extraterrestrial intelligence or whatever which one you chose. Three years later, um, a, a guy called uh, David Anderson decided there was a great advantage here of making a general framework to allow the computation or the use of volunteer computers. <coughs> so he came up with Boink, um, which is the Berkeley Open Infrastructure for Network Computing, and he was at California Berkeley. And the first project based on Boink that was launched was Predictor at Home, um, and then that was shortly followed by CETI at Home and Climate Predictor Dogman. So CETI actually went from their own uh, system into, into Boink. Now, <coughs> What's the summation of that? Well, I did another Google search trend on volunteer computing, and I got a much sadder graph. Again, remember this is normalized. I don't know how big these numbers are, but that's, that's not a great trend. Citizen science is turning up. What we're seeing here is the, the, the computation thing isn't capturing the imagination of the public. E research. Okay, so with uh, with point. So unused resources for a worthy cause was basically the tagline, uh, making science accessible to all required science. Um, now, point was a complete middleware system for volunteer computing. It included. Um, both the client, the client GUI, application runtime, server software, and software managing the, uh, implementing the project website. But it actually still required quite a lot of um, code to be written by the people who were, this was just a communication framework in a way, it required a lot of code to be written by the um, proposers of the project. And that wasn't free. Um, I think, uh, now look, I couldn't find it anywhere, but I remember once having a chat with David, um, and I, if I remember correctly, so it was a long time ago, he, he estimated between $100,000 and $200,000 worth actually needed to create the software to run on point. Um, that's a big investment. Uh, but as I said, I, I'm not positive I remember correctly, and I, I couldn't find it written down anywhere. But anyway, so there's this big upfront investment. Now, there was a bit of a gold rush at the start, and Boink, and Folding, and the high-profile um, project captured most of the volunteers. And once people signed up, they didn't tend to change. So there wasn't much dynamicism. So after this had been going for a number of years, one of the problems was that the, the new projects that came in, unless they got a lot of media attention, a lot of press, didn't get a sufficient share of the volunteer computing cake to make that big investment worthwhile. So we're starting to see the recipe for stagnation. And by the way, Boink's stagnating. It's still running, it's still providing an enormous number of petaflops, it's still a great resource, but it's not growing. Okay, now where was I? Oh yeah, it was funded initially by NSF, I believe it still is. Um, 56 projects, uh, 700... Yeah, that, line, that line's a little bit misleading. An international network of more than 760,000 computers a year in theory. There's less of those actually used or available at any one time. Um, and if you were to combine all of Exiting power, its, it's to overall power is, is equivalent to one of the world's top 10 supercomputers. It's had a lot of successes. It's helped design cancer drugs. Um, it's searched for CD. I, I, think, I think they've found an extra, extra solar planet in it. Anyway, there's been a variety of successes. But the real question here that I'm going to ask is, is it achieving its potential? And I'm going to make the observation that all forms of citizen science are subject to the whim of popularity. And this is a difficult thing for, for us to manage. Uh, basically, it's a it's, Boink is struggling to sway the cloud. 
Um, and I'll give some more values around it, and, and I hope you'll see what I mean. So what's the value of Boink? Well, I found some again, I found some numbers. Uh, a typical Boink project uses a petaflop of computing, which costs maybe $100,000 a year to purchase. If you go and buy it... Oh, no, that's not... Sorry, I get it. No, sorry, the $100,000 is software maintenance. If you were to go and buy the same amount of computing power on the Amazon cloud, it would cost you $40 million. So you've got that initial investment of oh, I, what I said was about $200,000, and then maybe in a, in a program of per year per project, so $100,000 a year. So that, that's a massive win. There's, there's no question it's a massive win. So let's look at some statistics. Hello, statistics. Tell us all sorts of interesting things. So, in 2011, when I wrote my first paper around Boink, these are the numbers I wrote in it. Boink had, at that stage, 2.3 million users. Only half a million of them were actively contributing. It totaled about 5.5 petaflops, which back in 2011 seemed a lot. These are the statistics I pulled down yesterday. Um, as you can see, in six years, we've had a slightly fancier uh, graphic available. There were 3.8 million registered users. So that's up. 266,000 were active at that particular moment. Now, that's not an average. So, but just be clear, that's half of what that estimate was. So then I did it again today. 17.8 petaflops. So it's, 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 you know, it's got a lot more petaflops, but that's because the machines have got better. The time I sampled it again, there were 347,000. So still nowhere near the half a million of us were active back in 2011, but we do have a lot more power. Um, the, the, question, the question is safety and folding, you, you just screen saver, and that's it, that's all you need to do. Here, if you're going to be an active user, what do you need to do? Can you just leave it running in the background? Yeah, or you, you can. Yeah. You basically have to, start, you know, have a computer with it installed and leave it running. So it's, it's, it's as easy as the screen saver. It's really. not hard. Yeah. But you have to install it. Yeah, mm -hmm. correct. And you have to install it through changes of device. And, you know, Remember, and those aren't necessary skills everybody has. But once you register, I mean, what, what would make you a registered user but not a, a well, registered user? Well, you register, for, you can register and then you download the software. And then do nothing with it. Or you download it and install it once. But the important thing, the important thing from this, um, I think. Came about in a really uh, I found a headline from 2017, so only written recently. US supercomputer needs more people power. And that's, it, it was a really interesting article because it, it, it sort of summarized things that we've been observing for the last, you know, back in 2011, basically. That Boink is struggling to increase its uh, user participation. User participation has gone down. It's just computers have got more power. It's been running for 15 years, more or less, to support research projects, but it hasn't really maintained, it's certainly not growing, its network of users. Um, of its 4 million registered, only 6% are active, typically, and it, as it says here, it's been falling since 2014. And this is what David Anderson wrote, I'm constantly looking for ways to expose sectors of the general population to the point, and it's a struggle. And it was a struggle when I talked to him in 2011. It was a struggle when I talked to him in 2012. Um, he used to come to East Science, by the way. Did you ever meet him? Yes. Yes. Plenty of times, I'm sure. He's a nice guy. I, 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 I visited him at Berkeley, too. You know He's yeah, so yeah. enthusiastic. Yeah. And you say, how can somebody so enthusiastic about what he's doing? have had this symptom, the, 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 the general disinterest of the population. And it's that, you know, how do we make it more interesting? How do we get people involved? That, that's the problem. So, you know, here's the Google trend of point. Right. That's sad. Yeah. It's incredibly sad. 
is not deserved. It's <sighs> not personal involvement, maybe, right? Like you mentioned, the happiness of yeah. going around and doing things and seeing them happen. It's being part of the community. And, yeah. and yeah. not just lending your computer to some obscure computation. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an active versus a passive interaction. Yes. So, <laughs> yeah. so much for this being half an hour talk, and so much for me not. <laughs> where am I going to get up? Okay. From? Okay. So, the trouble is, you know, comes back to swaying the crowd. Despite lots, not just several, despite lots of initiatives to boost participation, there, there's been no real increase. Um, I mean, here are some of the attempts, right? He partnered or Blink partnered with, with HTC, a Taiwanese mobile phone um, company, to pre-install it on the, the Android devices. So you can get it on Android, iPhone. Did it help? No. It's right there on their device. Nothing. Didn't take off. It didn't go viral. Nothing happened. He also was talking. I don't know how he's going with that. I, I haven't caught up with that. To include the distribution of boinking gaming consoles. Because they just sit there too long. Right? Oh. So that um, players can choose to contribute to boink, and here was the nice incentive and be rewarded with game credits. That is good. Yeah. I don't know how, I don't know where he's got with that. Mm -hmm. But he's, you know, he's trying to get the, the, the public engaged. Um, and, you know, some of the individual res researchers, the project owners, have got creative. One <laughs> gives Lego. To contribute, and uh, he's also looking at uh, doing some three D printing to make custom toys as further incentives. So, I mean, people are trying here to engage the communities, but we've got this level of abstraction, separation. That, that's a problem we always have as computer scientists. You know, s somebody can come and build something really nice, make a piece of art, do, do a piece of design, and you know, people can appreciate it, and they take you know, it's an algorithm. <laughs> we, we're we're just not very. Um, yeah, sexy sometimes. Okay, so there were some other issues. One of the things to try and get people to to to, to participate more, to contribute more resources, was to produce lead tables. And he did this very early on and produced a leaderboard of the biggest contributors. Mm -hmm. And what was the net result of that? They cheated. They got the data packets in, they sent fraudulent ones out, so they got a lot of throughput and they got to the top of the leaderboard for bragging ones. It, it spoiled so much data. So you're always, even in a situation like this, where you're volunteering computing resources to help the public good people. So, I mean, this comes back to my asterisk. On that previous statement as well. Yeah, there's there's some studies on bird watchers as well yes. where they think their data to to get stars. Yes, yes, yes. And this is something you have to be so careful with when you try and incentivize things. And even if they're incentivized with something of little value, it's surprising what people find value in. I mean, I don't understand, frankly. Um, so they had to introduce four-way redundancy. So every single piece of data had to be sent up to four separate people or groups and then come back and then cross-validate. So you cut your potential computation power by mm -hmm. down to a quarter of what it was. It's sad. Um, there was also this inequity I mentioned slightly earlier where new projects tend to start, not attract many volunteers, which means the initial investment in actually building the software was never really paid. And I'm, I'm going to make this extremely cruel statement because it is actually doing useful work, it's still working, it's still supported, but volunteer computing is, I think, currently a missed opportunity. It's not been the enormous thing it could have been. It's not... Its success has been this size instead of that mm -hmm. size. So, excuse me for a moment. What was that slide doing? <laughs> mm. 
Okay, okay. So, going back to Boink in that original slide, back in, in 2011, when I started this project with a student, um, we asked that question, and we really came up with these reasons. And so this was back in 2011, and if anything, it's more, these are more true. <coughs> Boink had a lack of visibility. It had barriers for entry to new users. A lack of ease in identifying and joining appropriate projects, low visibility for new projects, and low levels of active contribution. So we thought, well, we've been doing some interesting thinking about how to incentivize people, how to build incentive systems, so let's try working out what we can do with that. And we wanted to do it in Facebook, because there's so many people on Facebook. In 2011, looking at my old um, slides, it was 800 million. Um, I think I, I saw on the BBC a couple of days ago that it's getting really close to 2 billion. Again, a number that makes me slightly wobbly. Even if 1% of Facebook users joined and contributed actively, and I think it's, uh, that's 20 million users versus the current half million, less than half a million. Um, you know, if you want to approximate how many petaflops there is, I reckon that's about 200 petaflops, which would be a lot. A lot. So, what we did is we carried out this project to actually try and do, a social, do some social engineering, build it into Facebook, and use that as a front-end point. Now, we, we actually engineered it to go viral. We, well, we really did what things we thought would make it go viral, but uh, we, we, we didn't actually have the resources to do it to do a sufficient job of it. I still think the fundamentals are right, but we never really got it launched as an app that looked pretty, that made people want to do it and share it with their friends, as we'd hoped. Um, partly because the interesting thing at that, at that stage, you know, who, who here actually writes things for Facebook? They changed the API on us every three months when we were doing this. Really? Yeah, it was so annoying. <laughs> and we'd get it almost changed so anyway, how am I going to do this in five minutes? I'm not. So, um, what we wanted to do was build a social cloud for public e-research on, um, uh, on Facebook. And um, we wanted to take advantage of deep Facebook integration. We wanted to, we wanted to take advantage of the then social channels, news feeds, requests, notifications. And we, wanted, we, tr we identified three sort of um, incentive mechanisms that we wanted to address. The first was we wanted to help orphan projects, those new projects that didn't get any volunteers because they didn't have a visibility. So we came up with the idea of having project champions and building that into um, uh, the incentive system. Recruitment. Obviously we want people to recruit their friends, you know, it's, it's a whole pyramid scheme, right? So we, identi we wanted to identify what we called social anchors. These were people who had um, the right, not just lots, but the right type of friends mm -hmm. to, um, to be uh, contributing to the uh, growth of the project. And we wanted to recognize people who had lots of compute to contribute. And these are the only ones that get, um, get, get noted in the current version of Boeing. It's, it's to people with lots of computation. So we wanted to recognize this in three different ways to try and fill out all of those the, the, the holes in why the system is uh, you know, stagnating. And um, we also wanted to make it easier for new users, because this was something we identified, to choose a set of projects that they would contribute to easily. Because no one wants to look through 50 project descriptions and just, there's too much work, I haven't got time for that, I've got TV to watch or something, right? So we wanted to make that step easy, because this was actually where a lot of people were coming in, getting to the project selection phase, and just not selecting projects. So um, we did actually, uh, 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 please feel free to laugh, this was what Facebook looked like in 2011. <laughs> um, it doesn't really look like that anymore, but this was the, this was, this was the application you actually built, this was the front end, um, and you, you can, these are the recommended projects, it tells you you can click on learn more to find out more about the individual projects. So these are the ones that came out of the project recommender. Um, 
it showed you how many of your friends in common, of course this is all fake now, um, and you could add this project. It did actually work, uh, but uh, it, it never got launched. So this was the rough architecture. Um, the user volunteer interacts with the, the app and Facebook, which then interacted with the social cloud middleware, which replaced um, replaced uh, I forgot what it's called. It replaced a component in Blink, um, but or it wrapped it, I should probably say, and it interacted with the Blink client, which still had to be installed on the user's PC. What they didn't just unfortunately get away with installing the Facebook app. They then communicated with the project servers and so on and so forth. So there's a bit more detail there. I'm wary of the fact that I got this completely wrong in terms of link. But I'll just do a quick, quick, quick. So finding people the right projects or recommending people the right projects, we basically got them to fill in a quiz. It's, you know, what sorts of things are you interested in? Do you like birds? Do you like stuff? And we created a, an interest signature from that. And then we also used an interest signature based on each project, and we just did a simple Euclidean distance. It was, it was a proof of concept. But it did give you a set of projects that you're more likely to be interested in. And we wanted to incentivize uh, involvement, contribution, and growth. So... We, these project champions. So people got project credits for contributing to projects, and project champions got a share of the credits everybody they brought in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it was a pyramid scheme, right? <laughs> so what the idea of this was that if you were a project champion for an underrepresented project, you got a bigger slice of the pie. Yes. So you were incentivized to pick those poor orphan lonely projects and get all your friends to do them because then you go straight up to the top of the shiny star. Um, so there's some formulas there that carried out that kind of, uh, not for project champion. Um, social, social anchors. Social anchors were interesting. What we wanted to do was find people who had a high density of productive friends. So what do I mean by that? So somebody who has a lot of friends who don't only contribute a small, small amount aren't as interesting as somebody who brings in a whole lot of new people. So somebody who has a large number of friends who aren't already somehow connected with the project is more attractive than somebody who's already got most of their friends in the project or interested. So we were focusing on social anchors who could, who could expose us to the greatest no, um, virgin territories. And so those formulas were around achieving that. And um, so the actual words I probably should say here are New users with the least number of existing friends in the social cloud are of high value because they have a lot more potential to bring in new users from new social clusters. Well, that's what we thought, anyway. And it, the simulations were pretty, pretty promising. So we, we verified all of these in simulations. Um, and then the compute magnets, um, where you know they get a share of their friends' contributions and... So there's a social pressure in there for them to get their friends to contribute. So we were trying all the angles to try and get people to invest in this. Um, now the only graph I'm going to show you, because I'm aware I'm well over time at this point, was project champions. So this is a simulation result. We had five projects there. Um, we started them out with uh, a resource share, and this was just testing the, the, the project champion. So obviously, having Project Champion move to one of these and then provide the influence as we had them tend to an even share. So, I mean, we did simulate each of those mechanisms and they did actually do what we wanted them to do. Now, I'm just going to um, skip some stuff. Well, 
what we were trying to do was increase in, in visibility and engagement. We were trying to address those exact problems of point. Provide basically to provide more computational power to the researchers. Now we we didn't get far enough to actually have this be the huge success we would have liked. But what we really want to focus on is that the social uh, Volunteer computing is a lost opportunity. We actually need new ideas, we need new projects to try and fix this incredibly valuable thing, to make it more exciting, to make people feel a sense of community, to make um, people want to contribute. Because it, it makes me sad when I realise what we could have had that we don't. And it's all just being burnt by time. Now, if you go and look at the Boink page, I was going to show you the Boink page, but if you go and look at the Boink page, and you scroll down, it's got a leaderboard that most people won't get on because it's only the top 100. Mm. And it's, it's got a forum, but it's really got nothing there that appeals to the current generation of millennials of, 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 of these sorts of people. So, I, I'm not insulting, honestly, I promise. <laughs> um, so it really needs to be reimagined. This, this is something that should have been a great success, and it's a tragedy in my mind that it's not. So, what I've kind of tried to present here is a, is, a, is a description of what happened, what I think went wrong, and hope to inspire at least some people to think about how they could reinvent that. How we can take this great idea and actually make it work. Because it's, it's an idea that deserves to work. Mm -hmm. um, I had lots of other stuff. <laughs> Thank you. It was nice coming all the way to the Brazil. Oh, uh, yes, 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 of course. A any chance you attended the Boeing workshop in 2011? Did I attend in 2011? I don't think so. Were you there? I, I was there. So I worked with, with Boeing like for three years. Yep. And I'm very curious, I once got a question I never was able to answer. So. Oh dear, I don't <laughs> like the sound of it. So, so I'm really... I, I'm really willing to, to know an answer to this. So, I once got asked, like, Boink is really nice to, to get computing power for, for very computationally heavy problems. Yes. But the footprint of transferring the files for, like, all over the world might be a cost that is not, like, taken into account, right? It's not taken into account. I mean, and this cost bandwidth from the individual users, which is a disincentive, you're absolutely right. I wonder how much is true now, though. You see, that's that's different. I mean, I, I've got an unlimited broadband at home. Yeah. I, I suspect most people now do. And that's an entirely different... Maybe maybe this is one of the reasons it's time for a reboot. Because, I mean, Boink is great for these enormous big bags of tasks. But yes, it costs you real money. Yeah. Not only money, but like the energy footprint of doing that. Of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so well, that's, what, that, that, that was, that, that's was certainly it. a true thing, right? This is kind of the opposite of green computer. Yeah, yeah, it's really costly, like. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I don't have an answer. It is exactly the opposite of green computing. I don't have an answer for that. Okay. But uh, certainly, I, I wonder if it would be more successful now simply because that network cost is an issue for most, most people. I think you need to go, right? Uh, not me, but, uh, but uh, there's uh, still your... Uh, uh, but you have to finish the floor, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah and and I, I, I'm burning um, Hero's time. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, would you be able to send us or leave us your slides yes, so that afterwards... Course those who are interested can look through yep. them, because one thing is the video, but the other one is, uh, and you have not shown everything. No, no. But so, I got this through the most of the important okay. stuff. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation, and um, I'll now present, the, is that okay, or? You know, so, oh, oh, okay. I now have the pleasure to present the next speaker, which is Professor Jairo, as we say in Portuguese, right? Jairo Gutierrez, uh, who is the deputy head of the School of Engineering, Computer and Mathematical Sciences of Auckland University of Technology. 
by the way, both uh, scientists and another group there are uh, have been visiting us almost the whole day, offering all kinds of opportunities to all students who want to go to New Zealand. Uh, they have lots of money and they have lots of interesting projects. Okay, one of the fields of uh, research has been briefly presented, and now we'll see a second one. This is good advertising, right? <laughs> Anyways, so, um, and um, he's going to talk to us about, wow, Internet of Things, security, which we all know is a huge problem. Internet? Especially the environment. Uh, especially all the time. Yeah, but you know, particularly in the environment. When you think about everything that can happen to you, and invade your life and, and kill you at the Internet of Things. I should not advertise your talk like that. It's going to prevent us, right, from having accidents and things like that. I think you're going to teach us about that. So, thank you, sorry thank you. for the joke, but that's, no, no, that's my right. style of, uh, of introducing <laughs> nice speeches. I'm going to start with another. Uh... And uh, will you be able to read by the, your slides as well? Yeah, they're there. Well, that's right. great. This is, uh, Thank you. you to... um, as Professor Claudio was saying, one of the uh, interests of our visit was to um, try to find common areas of interest mm -hmm. uh, in research, uh, staff exchange, student exchange. And um, I just want to uh, tell you a little bit about my own research group back at Open AUT. Um, we have a number of areas of research in our school, uh, but our group is uh, um, the Network Security Research Group, and um, we have a few. This, the color is kind of off, but uh, yeah. we have a few um, staff members there in our group. And, we also have some uh, associates. These are people that are collaborators, uh, although they are not permanent staff members of our school. Uh, they, some of them are doing postdocs. Some of them are working in other uh, uh, places. And we also have a um, number of PhD students in our group. At the moment, I, um, I supervise six of them, and I co-supervise another seven uh, in this uh, group. I don't have photos for all of them, but um, uh, and the, the talk that I'm going to show you today is uh, part of the work that David uh, has done here. And um, let me tell you a little bit about some of the work that we're doing. Uh, Fadi on the corner there, he's working on um, privacy preserving data sharing models for health records. Um, Mohi is working on the um, gamification for uh, research, for postgraduate research, so using gamification techniques to improve uh, research outcomes. Uh, we have Hanif in the middle there. Uh, Hanif is working on uh, Security for cloud computing systems uh, using a, a defense in depth a, a idea of, of a security. And we have a Amino here. This Amino is working on a, a trust based a protocols, but for not for the Internet of Things, but a related area, which is a, a wireless ad hoc uh, networks. So that's uh, some of our groups. Some of the topics that we cover uh, are here. So it's a little bit of from some of the lower layers in terms of the computing stack all the way to uh, applications and even things like business models uh, and uh, uh, services. Uh, and our newest topic is on Emergency communications, we have um, 
uh, proposals uh, uh, to uh, use uh, smartphones basically uh, with, with the emergency channels when you have a, a disaster like an earthquake or a flood or uh, something that will compromise the system infrastructure. And we are, there is also a, a, a student there working on, on the drones so that you can deploy emergency uh, ad hoc networks uh, during the uh, disaster situation. So that's a little bit of our group. Now let me just quickly switch to the actual presentation. Uh, I decided just to, out of what we do in the group, I decided just to take a slice of the research that we did there. Uh, and the slice that we decided to take is uh, on, on the uh, routing protocol for the Internet of Things. David is our PhD student. Uh, Saya, uh, I'm the primary supervisor and Sayan is a co-supervisor. Uh, the Internet of Things was a, a motivation for us because what is happening with this Internet of Things is that like many things in uh, emerging technologies, the main uh, need for these things is they want something that works and that solves a particular problem and that people are actually willing to pay money for it. That's the main criteria for a lot of these startup companies and so on. Security is really something that is usually added on later on, if, if at all. So there is an interesting uh, gap in there between all of these things that are useful and that people are willing to pay money for and that work and that you know, may be the basis of a company and solutions are actually secure. So we thought that that was a... A, a, a field that was ripe for, for a lot of a, a work, for a lot of research. Now, uh, you probably have seen things similar. This is not even ours. This is, I think, this was someone put that up. Just to give an idea of uh, where this technology is being uh, used uh, everywhere, basically, industry, logistics, uh, smart homes, uh, devices, uh, new cars. I mean, th these days, uh, uh, a modern car is, uh, you, you take a BMW Series 7, it's really a local area network on wheels. You know, you have more than 25, 30 IP addresses wow. just on your, on, your, on your car with a whole bunch of sensors for your normal operations, but also for um, uh, diagnostics and servicing and so on. So you have sensors going in, in every uh, possible uh, domain. And uh, then immediately, this is the, the point that we were talking about. With the rapid spread of these sensors getting into all these application domains, you get the issue of vulnerabilities. In security, there is a concept called the attack surface. When, when you talk about the attack surface, this is the area that is potentially a vulnerability in a particular system. Mm -hmm. What has happened with the Internet of Things is that it has uh, made this attack surface much, much bigger. So suddenly, the things that can be attacked, the things that can be compromised, is so much uh, wider. Another way of putting this is the target has grown. You know, it's, a, it's a huge target in terms of uh, uh, security. Now, um, obviously, you cannot try to solve all the problems on, with a PhD thesis, which is this uh, work. Uh, and normally, what you do is you you pick one particular area that you want to go deep and, and try to provide a, a, a solution. And we selected uh, the security of the data that is being used by the protocols that help these sensors route information. So we are not even looking at the payload of these uh, packets. We are looking at the making sure that the control bits that are used uh, to, to enable the routing protocol uh, are free of attacks as much as possible. So uh, when we look at uh, routing protocols, we quickly uh, 
narrowed uh, our search into um, using and uh, looking at RPL uh, simply because it's uh, the most popular routing protocol used for the Internet of Things, but it, it is a, a routing protocol that has some uh, vulnerabilities in terms of uh, security. Now, uh, what type of attacks is this protocol um, uh, vulnerable to? A whole bunch of, of attacks. Uh, they are all variations of attacks that eventually end up in packets being dropped, packets which will never arrive to the uh, destination in one way or, or another. Black hole, total drops, gray hole, where some packets are delivered and some are not, so that you are fooled into believing that the connection oh, is not really an attack, it's just perhaps a, 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 a faulty wireless link uh, and, and a few other permutations of those uh, attacks. So I'm sorry, we um, it's just that I do not know much about, or nothing about this. Right. Uh, but from what I understand, these attacks, uh, they are based not on introducing malicious whatever, but on uh, stealing packages, thereby creating holes and making you believe there is a problem. And, uh, yeah, but some of these attacks are based on introducing false information. Okay. Uh, yeah. Because, for instance, RPL, to calculate some of the nodes where you're going to uh, deliver the packets, uh, it uses a rank system. Mm -hmm. And according to the rank of the nodes, then you give preference to certain pathways in the network. Yeah. And some of these attacks actually pull the nodes in the network yeah. so that they reroute packets. So, so in a way, some false information is introduced mm -hmm. to, to make the protocol misbehave. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, no, that's, a, that's fine. Uh, now, a um, couple of attacks in here. The most obvious, given the way RPL operates, is the one that messes with the rank. Yeah. Uh, RPL is based on assigning a rank to the different nodes, and according to that rank, you decide how to uh, 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 route the packets. If you influence these ranks, then you are interfering with this and you are making the protocol behave in a way that the attacker is sort of manipulating. Mm -hmm. Rather than if the, if the protocol is left to, 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 to run uh, without any attacks. The other one, the civil attacks are really more of a, a coordination and, and almost creating the the, the, the illusion that more there are more malicious attacks uh, that there really are. And basically this is to push the network to isolate some nodes. So in a way, in a, in a way it's like a denial of service attack. Uh -huh. Because if you fool the network into isolating a, a portion, believing that that's all compromised, and they're not, you, you simply disconnect those nodes, and th those are nodes that will never receive the packets, and therefore it's a, it's a denial of service uh, attack. So, uh, if, if, if we look at the, the rank attack, the idea here is to uh, advertise a false path by, by changing the, the rank. And uh, so suddenly the node that is trying to forward a pack receives this false information about this particular pathway that on paper looks better than the one that I was using. Mm -hmm. So therefore I'm going to choose to, to, to send my packet uh, uh, that way. And, and uh, you, know, you, you, can, you can either reroute the packets to a sort of man in the middle attack and those packets are captured, or you simply drop them and, and, and in a way, that's a, a denial of service attack again. So the, the sort of problems in here, of course, is to, to try to uh, damage the functioning of the network. Uh, routing loops, again, uh, generates a denial of service attack because if you force, by using false information, you force these packets to go into a routing loop. 
you will never go to the destination. And eventually these things time out, and basically uh, uh, the, the effect is that that, that, uh, that packet is not um, delivered and it will have to be uh, retransmitted uh, and so on. So some of the consequences of having an unstable uh, network. Now, um, obviously what you do with this type of projects is you try to see what is out there that is related to what we're trying to do that is similar. Uh, how, we know that there is a problem. We know that RPL is vulnerable to attacks. So what else has been done to address these shortcomings of RPL? And we found a few things, uh, but um, they, they still have some uh, weaknesses, you know, a, a few good ideas in some of this uh, uh, related work. But for instance, if you take the middle one, uh, some of the problems with the middle one were uh, in terms of very complex trust calculations. And remember what these nodes in the internet of things, they are very limited in the resources. So they are, you're trying to have sensors that are very cheap so that you can deploy them everywhere. But to make them very cheap, they really don't have a lot of uh, capabilities. So you cannot have a complicated formula to calculate trust because uh, it would not be efficient. Some of them are vulnerable to some of the attacks that we have discovered in the, in the uh, literature review. Uh, some of them do not scale well. Remember this idea about scalability, that they work fine if you have a few nodes, but if you try to, to, to uh, uh, use them with a very large node, then uh, uh, it doesn't really work. So, Okay, so what have we done? We uh, targeted RPL because of, uh, of its widespread use. Look at the type of attacks that are uh, successful with that type of a standard protocol. Look at the solutions that are out there and then decided to uh, introduce a new uh, modified RPL and try to see how it compares with the, with the standard uh, RPL. And um, tell you a little bit about the, the methodology. I know that this is a bit boring, but from the point of view of PhD, this is really uh, important. Uh, not only we did the a simulation study to do the comparison, but we also did a, a, a testbed implementation. So we actually bought some sensors and uh, installed the sensors uh, in a lab and uh, and did the measurement with the, with the sensors, and I'm going to show you the results on the simulation and also on the test bed between the model that we propose, the enhanced uh, RPL, and, and the standard RPL. Now, uh, just quickly to, to, to explain how we modify this RPL, uh, the basic operation with, with uh, this protocol is to, um, you create an inverted tree. That's a big Claudia says. Thank you. The protocol creates an inverted uh, tree with the, uh, this uh, uh, sync node at the root. And then you, you have these messages that are used to propagate the rank uh, uh, data, the run info, and to build the the pathways to all the different nodes in the in the in the network. So that's that's how uh, uh, it is done. Now, what the attacks try to do is to inject misinformation in this run calculation, so that you uh, are actually sending these packets in the in the wrong way. Now. Um, what we decided to do is, let's add another metric. And the metric is, is a, a measurement, something that you calculate, and you will use that to, to make a better decision. So let's add something else other than the rank, because we know that this rank is being manipulated. 
this rank is being altered. This is how the attack works. So let's add something that cannot be tampered with. And we look at the idea of trust. And the idea of, of trust in simple terms is, I have a few nodes that I'm working with, and I want to, I would like to know which nodes I should trust more than others. It would be a great thing if I somehow can have a little list that tells me, oh, whenever I send notes to, whenever I send packets to this particular node, that's a reliable node. They always sort of deliver my packet. When I send to this particular node, half of the time they deliver my packet. And when I send to this particular node, almost never, the packets are almost never delivered. So I will say I trust this one first, sort of high trust, this is middle trust, this one I don't trust at all. So if I have a way of knowing how much trust I can place on the different nodes, then I have a richer metric, a richer characteristic to know how I interact with these uh, 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 nodes. So that's, that's the whole idea of, of, of trust. Now, the other thing is we have to find a way to produce a, a metric that is easy to compute. Remember one of the problems that we have with the, some of the solutions is where they were a bit complex and, you know, it's not, not very suitable for these nodes. So, how do you encode this trust uh, in such a way that it's not too complex for these nodes to, to do? I'll just probably skip this. Uh, some, well, what one I would mention is uh, making sure that you're not confusing a node that is being um, erratic, that is faulty, uh, with a node that is malicious. Because sometimes with wireless networks, wireless channels are not totally reliable. A cable is a lot more reliable. Wireless, there is noise, there is other devices and so on. Sometimes you actually have packets that are dropped simply because the channel is not a, a good quality channel. So we need to have a, a way to distinguish between actual malicious uh, uh, nodes or nodes that temporarily might be faulty, but they're actually okay. They are not attacking nodes. So that's, that's one in, the important point here. So, uh, what we did is, let's try to find something that will uh, measure from the total number of packets that I send and the total number of packets that are actually forwarded, that are actually delivered, uh, I, will, I will give a, 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 a rank, a trust measurement to, to the nodes. Now, I have a, a, a weight here. So, the, the, the more of these packets that are dropped, the bigger this number becomes, and the bigger this number becomes, the smaller this number becomes, right? Because if I have a larger denominator, then this, is, this becomes a smaller number. If, if all the packets that I, that I said are uh, uh, delivered okay, then that will, that will give me the highest trust possible. So it's simple to calculate, simple to, to transmit that information. A little bit about the definitions that we use in that uh, formula. Uh, and we, we play a little bit with the penalty weight, just to make sure what, what will be a good uh, way to use in there so, to, so that I have a good differentiation between the different levels of trust. And a uh, couple of things about that. Uh, so the computation of those trust values, I already have a, a, a little bit, say a little bit about that. Uh, the phase where we are gathering this information, so for a little while, when we start the network, very first time, I don't have any trust values. There must be a little bit of operation while I start uh, collecting this information. And there is also an issue of um, sort of uh, integrity. Uh, there is a, uh, something that we have added in here in case some of the uh, data, the control bits, uh, have been 
uh, altered during during transmission because that's another way of attacking us, changing the, the control bit. So we have a, a way of checking that, that that data has not been altered. Um, and then just the, the uh, how we use this trust rating system. Uh, we want to go from the high trust to the lowest trust. Uh, and we want to make sure that if I have systems that uh, one one thing with uh, with I, uh, sensors, they have problem with battery power, and some sensors when the battery is being depleted, they might decide not to forward packets just to preserve battery. So they are not being malicious. They are just looking after themselves first. You know, the battery is running out. Uh, I have been collaborating, but suddenly my battery is dropping, so I'm going to preserve battery. So we have to make sure that we don't classify that as a malicious node. It's just a malicious that, it's a, it's a node that temporarily this node is not co cooperating, but it's not, a bad, it's not a bad guy. I don't want to sort of blacklist this uh, node. So I need to have a routine somehow, we call it a recuperation system, a routine that will allow me to later on bring this node back into my, my structure, not, not completely isolated the node. Okay, I apologize because I know that this is very hard to, to read, but what we have done here is, in the start you have the normal RPL inverted tree structure that I show you, that box there in red, uh, where, where you have trust calculation, that's what we have added uh, here, plus uh, the detection of the different types of attacks. So we filter uh, for the, the type of attacks. And only when we get to uh, making sure that none of these attacks are taking place, then we uh, going to the rating, trust rating process. On the right hand side, you have the routine for the recuperation. So this is the case where the sensor battery is depleting, it's not a malicious node, but I want to give this node chance to recover battery power and then bring it back into the system. So you say, in here we say, is the battery being depleted? Yes. In that case, I'm not going to uh, route any packets to that node. I'm going to allow for time to the for the battery to recharge, and then I will bring it back back into the fold, back into the into the system. So the, this is a summary of the uh, modifications to the standard RPL. In a way, this is a, let's put it this way: this is the algorithm contribution uh, 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 of this work. And if you look at this in here, um, and, and again, we have to change uh, the code for the simulator and for um, the other software that we use. We have to check so that we have an implementation of RPL without changes, and we have our modified one. That pink thing there that you have in there, that's what we added. Everything else that you see there, is the normal RPL protocol. What we have done is, rather than just relying on the rank, we have added the trust engine. So this trust engine, this is what adds that formula that I show you. This is what says, I'm not going to just use the rank, I'm going to use this trust uh, metric that has been uh, incorporated. So that's it, Th those were the changes. And then um, just two, two more bits to this word is just to, uh, let me just quickly recap. Uh, we have identified a few, a few things that we want to change. We have made those changes by adding a trust metric. And now we are going to run some simulation to compare the uh, standard RPL with the modified one. And then I will show you the test bed, uh, results. And then I'll be happy to take questions and tell you a little bit more about this. A uh, little bit about the simulation platform that was used. 
um, Contiki, Contiki, this is a, an open uh, platform. You don't have to pay for this. Google it, there's a website, you can download this uh, platform. It's uh, pretty good. Uh, we did a simulation on a, a smart home situation where you have a number of sensors. The sensors are the, um, the green ones. There is the sink uh, node, which is sort of the, the one that you find at the uh, top of the inverted tree. And in this case, we have uh, some malicious nodes. These are the ones attacking, which are the red ones. So those, those are the, I think I have a table here of the parameters. Uh, oh, by the way, we did this, in the whole world uh, thesis, we, we did it with five types of attacks, but in here I'm going to show you results of only two types of attacks. Uh, so the complete work has five types of, of attacks. Here we're going to look at the, the ones that I introduced at the very beginning, rank attacks and, and civil attacks. Now, uh, these are, so, so there were 30 nodes uh, simulated, 26 okay uh, nodes, you know, good nodes, three that were the attack nodes, malicious nodes, and, and the sync node. This is just uh, an example of some of the uh, graphics of, of the simulation package. Uh, it changes all the time. Uh, basically, uh, this shows you how the different nodes are communicating. Uh, and uh, w when you are going to the simulation, you will see the red moving to the nodes that are uh, showing the transmission at that particular uh, moment. This is just a snapshot. Uh, and this is the sort of logs that are created by the simulation. This is the one, the standard. This is without our modification. This, and what you can see is that all it's doing is just calculating that rank, that rank that uh, RPL uses. And you see that uh, sometimes it's recompute and then they get a new value, but that, that's all it is doing. We are doing attacks and RPL is not catching any of the attacks. So there is no alarms, nothing, no red flags about this malicious nodes that are uh, in, in, in the network. Now, uh, just a little bit about these things. They, there are a few things that we try to capture in here as well. We try to look at the number of packets that are delivered. I, I have an example there. You see that blue arrow tells us that the, these packets are actually uh, uh, 46 bytes. So this is the, the packet size for this protocol. But 16 of those are, are control bits. And, and 30 is the actual payload. So you see in there, in the green arrow, you say 30. Th those are the 30, the actual data that was uh, uh, delivered. Um, and so that's the normal normal operation of the, of the protocol. Now, when we run SecTrust, which is our enhanced protocol, you see that now you get a number of uh, warnings about found the attacker, found the attacker. You, you see several of those being identified. This is every time that the, the modification that we have introduced is successful in identifying one of those uh, uh, malicious nodes because it's using that additional trust metric that we have uh, introduced. So these are some uh, diagrams. Uh, this is uh, under the first type of attacks, the rank attacks. Uh, the number of attacks are being uh, detected, so you see there that we set trust, these are the blue bars. As time goes by, we simulate one hour. Uh, we, we detect quite a, quite a number of attacks. When you look at the uh, 
the node rate run changes as well. Uh, it is a lot more stable. That's what that's what we're trying to measure on the second one. There, it's more more stable with with our modified one. And here is to do with packet loss. Look at all the packets that get lost with the original RPL. All that blue. Sometimes even 100% of the packets are dropped. Uh, here is pretty much around 20%, uh, which some cases have to do with the, the nature of the channel, but a lot better than what is happening with, with the RPL on, on the attack. So that's rank. And this is uh, the other one, the civil attacks. Again, a lot of attacks being detected versus zero if you run it on, on normal uh, RPL. And uh, the, the, the measure of, of uh, packet loss, which is actually one of the important ones, because this is the one that is linked to performance. This is the one, if you have a lot of packets, you have to do a lot of retransmissions. So eventually, these networks work, you know? They do retransmit a few times, but the performance uh, uh, really suffers. So, simulation results, consistent improvement of the, of the modified protocol. Uh, but we thought, what would be a good way of sort of having another way to validate this? And this is when, uh, we decided to go ahead and do this in, a, in an actual physical uh, network. So we bought, uh, it's a Spanish company, we bought a number of uh, sensors, it's a mode, it's little uh, Internet of Things sensors, um, fairly basic uh, uh, configuration, uh, low power, which is the type of uh, protocols that we were using, we, uh, this time we deployed those on a lab, and uh, mind you, we didn't have enough money to buy 30, so we <laughs> bought fewer than that. So we have the green ones are the, the normal ones, the red ones are the malicious, and the sink. This is attached to the main computer, uh, David's computer. So this was installed in a, in a lab, a real key. It's not very clear from there, but basically we hang those sensors from different parts in the in the lab. This is where the sync uh, uh, mode was, and that's the graphical display that we use from the software configuration. It's, it's a pity because this is it looks a lot better in the computer. But anyway, that's that's the, uh, the deployment of the of the modes. This is an interesting one. Um, this is how those inverted trees are uh, being built without our modification. And you will see that nodes 13 and 14 are malicious nodes. And you can see that these malicious nodes in the, in the standard RPL are being successful in, in fooling some of the nodes. They are actually engaging with some of the nodes. In here, 13 is completely isolated at, at that moment when we took this snapshot. 14 is still being a little bit successful, but this is a huge improvement over this one here. In here, you can already see that the malicious nodes are not being as effective uh, as, as uh, in this case here. And then the equivalent, equivalent diagrams that I showed you before, fairly consistent, I, I have to admit, fairly consistent on this one and this one. Not so consistent on that one, on, on the one on the right hand side. And we're trying to figure out what, why that is. Um, it might be what we're trying to measure there, but in terms of the attacks that are being discovered, and the difference, uh, the stability of the network, you know, this is very similar to the 20%. This one is a little bit more stable, but it's still high up. So very consistent with the, with the simulation. The one on the right hand side is a little bit over the, all over the place. Um, so that's rank attacks. And then we have civil attacks. Again, 
Let me show you this. 13 and 14, the malicious notes, without our modifications, are being quite, quite successful in their attacks. They, they are engaging with a few of these nodes. Here, uh, 13 is isolated, 14 is only fooling one, one particular node. So again, a much better uh, inverted tree in, in this situation. Uh, and then uh, our diagrams, this is with the, uh, uh, the second batch of results, very consistent on that, uh, on one and three. A, a, a bit confusing on, on the rank changes. Uh, but really, these are the two most meaningful results. You detect more attacks and you have better performance. So those really are the, the, uh, the big ones. So, uh, conclusions. Uh, we were very happy with the uh, results of the enhanced uh, protocol. Uh, happy with the with the um, uh, consistency between our simulation results and the actual deployment, the, the proof of concept, the test bed. Uh, there are still a few results that we're trying to analyze a bit more, but uh, uh, all in all, seems uh, uh, quite a um, a successful uh, proposal. We have already published a number of papers uh, uh, about this uh, site trust and um, it has been very, very well uh, received. I'm, I'm quite uh, pleased uh, with David's work. He's uh, planning to submit his thesis next month, in June. Uh, so that would be uh, uh, an interesting uh, sort of milestone for him to finally get this uh, 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 completed. And um, really some of the things that he wants to do afterwards in, in terms of uh, extending this work. But I'll, I'll stop uh, now and be quite happy to take a few questions if you have uh, any questions about uh, what we did, I'd, I'd be interested to see if anyone is working with related areas here uh, with you guys, if, if any of you guys are working on um, Internet of Things. Uh, I'd be happy to see what tools you're using, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, I have a uh, first congratulation for you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you, you say something about the, 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 the trust. Uh, for example, if I'm an issue load, uh, my colleague, uh, my neighbor knows. And uh, suppose I intend to fool this, this trust. Uh, uh, the, uh, they trust that uh, I am part of some packets. I am the, the leader of this trust. Yeah. And when, uh, for example, you, you say that if I are not say, uh, I'm not part of the, the, the package, they will know that this guy is not part of the package. In, if, if the node doesn't forward the package, yeah, right? Yes, right. Right. Sure. Uh, but if I power the package and I, and I, and I, I can do some modification in the app, in the reader. Very good they question. Will, they will receive yeah. the package, in the, in the, in the extract the package, check uh, all information. How, how does it work? Uh, very good question. That's the reason we, uh, we, we target availability and we target uh, integrity with this work. We don't look at confidentiality. In other words, we don't encrypt anything here. So we, we left the, remember what I said about PhD work, sometimes you actually have to be fairly narrow in what we do. And we, we make the assumption that uh, let's put uh, encryption on a side and let's uh, concentrate on integrity and availability. The availability, we can measure that because we know uh, the number of packets that have been sent, and we can measure the, the number of packets that have been received. So that helps us with the availability. But we have the checksum, the integrity checksum, that will let us know if the packet has been tampered with. So if we, whenever we receive the packet, we compute the checksum, we, we compare with the checksum that gets attached to the packet. If it doesn't match, we don't accept it. Actually, we consider a successful attack. 
So we, we won't be fooled by that. This is one of the things that the trust system has built in, uh, the, the checksum. Yeah. Any, any other? Any of you guys working in the Internet of Things? Anything that you can tell me about that? I'm really cool. Uh, well, uh, thank you. First of all, I have a question on the, um, the calculations of trust. Yep. Yes. You know, in the past, we did a lot of work here in using sensors and recovery. Uh -huh. So, uh, like, a, we are assuming always that this sensor has capacity to do some encryption. Right, yeah. yeah. Okay, this is this processor. I think the 16 bits that you are working on is this uh, X. Uh, remote. Yeah. The remote side, yeah. So, uh, that's what I'm curious about. What kind of algorithm is what are you using for computing that hash computation, that integrity? Of, we call it uh, trust calculations. There are two things in, in there. One is the trust calculator, which is basically a routine uh, that we included in the algorithm. And this is on C. But did you, you develop? Yeah, yeah. We, we added the code. And these modes allow you to, uh, they, it has a flash memory. And it allows you to add code in there. And the same, uh, the same. Uh, th this is with the test bed, but the same with the simulation. We use a, a simulation package that is open yeah. and allow us to change the, to add the routine to uh, add the trust measurement to the right... Uh, yeah, but this, is a, but this uh, routine is... Do you develop? Or do yes. you use an uh, uh, no, no, no. algorithm? Or? The, the, the one for trust, we develop. Yeah. The one for checksum, we use a standard... Uh, standard, standard. Yeah. 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 We, we develop the one for the trust. Yeah, no, the other one is just a standard. Yes. Standard yeah. Yeah. Okay. Usually this is for us something really interesting to, to see how to develop uh, Special techniques for this light weight recovery. Right, right. Yeah, devices, yeah. You see? So. And actually, what you what you uh, mentioned is, is uh, you know, wireless sensor networks, and there have been quite a bit of work with wireless sensor networks. Normally, the things that you see for wireless sensor networks assume that the nodes are more capable. Yes, exactly. So you have nodes that do encryption, that do all sorts of things, and that's fine because the nodes, you know, you get nodes that are a hundred, two hundred dollars. I mean, these notes, you point out that they are, you know, they're still capable, but these notes are only about $40. And the actual notes that I think will be very popular in the oral applications, I think they will be under $10. Yeah, but so I mean, they will be even yeah, but I mean, less capable. Even in that case, uh, we are actually working in a project with LG uh -huh. company. And what they tell us is that the model that we use is a farm processor. 32 bit processor. Right. Yeah. And they have, in most of the cases, a not capability <coughs> for this small device, small functions like encryption or hashes. Right. Not okay. public encryption, but at least symmetric. Yeah, symmetric encryption. And, and right. hashes, yes, yes. you can do that in yeah. a very efficient way. And even you today, um, take any a smartphone, the new ones today, they have capability to do more advanced encryption. Even yep. at one station, we can agree. Do yeah. That. Yeah. So it's not that uh, I think it, this concept of trust probably requires, I guess, in 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 other forms of cryptography, uh, to validate uh, in other ways, not just only experimental, but at least the concept of trust to me is not very clear. Like, I, I don't need to but you think you think that it will not scale, or no, you think that it's is not. That it could still yeah, be manipulated. I want, want some proof. I want something more theoretical proof about oh. this concept of trust. Okay. It's like, you, you, okay, you have a, a testing and a, a small uh, experiments, 30 nodes or anything. But, uh, but I even, uh, how do you know what you have 1,000 nodes? Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I, I think there are two issues that you're addressing here. One of them is scalability, you know, what happens if you have yeah. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 point taken. The other one is to have some sort of formal method yeah, applied formal to, method. to the way you're developing something yeah, exactly. like this. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. I mean, th these are interesting follow-ups to, to this type of research, no doubt about it. And, and actually, if you can think of something that we can do to extend this work with some of the things that you're doing, 
please let me know, because this will be interesting, you know. We already have all these toys that we have and the code and so on. And you say, well, Jairo, you're doing availability and integrity. I'm good in cryptography. Let's add a cryptography model. Perfect. Let's do it, you know. That, that would be a, a, an interesting uh, uh, project. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> cool. Yeah. Any other questions? Comments? All right, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Julio, could you tell Claudio that I'm